everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself. Okay, thank you. This uh, week's Torah portion is Vayichra. We, we begin a new book in the Torah. It's the center book of the, of the five books of Torah. Um, and it, it uh, you know, in English, in your English Bibles, it says Leviticus, because uh, I think they, they felt it was a lot of stuff for relating to the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. But in Hebrew, uh, the first word there is the, the Vayichra, uh, and, it's, and he called. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of themes. That, and Nathan has done a really good job of talking about this book. Pretty much the, the central theme is about being holy and set apart and being pure, because it's all the, the, the purity laws and the, and the ways to, to be holy. Because he says, be holy because I'm holy. So, uh, and it's how do we approach a holy God, uh, the theme of the uh, major themes of the book. And so he's, it starts out with that he's, he's calling us to come near. Uh, now, w w us in our fallen state, it's difficult to approach an unapproachable God. Uh, so he has to clean us up a bit. And he, we have to do some things to, to get, get into his presence. And so he lays out a pattern and a, a, a path for us to return to him. Um, us believers in Yeshua, our Messiah, can just see all the beauty and the, uh, all these type shadows that, that uh, are fulfilled in him. And if you do you know, any kind of internet search on the topic and everything, that, that's where most Bible commentators uh, approach that. They take those first couple chapters of the book of Leviticus and say, well, that was all fulfilled in Yeshua Messiah. Um, and that's true. But I think there's greater depth there. So this year, when, I, when this week came up and it was my week to teach, I thought, well, I'm going to diagram some of this out. And, I, and I'm sure there's deeper stuff in there that, that it's important for his people to know. So I'll, I'll uh, lead you on uh, where, where, where I was thinking, and I think you'll see it too, when we lay it out this way, uh, what, what patterns and path you see here, okay? Um, so chapter 1 begins with the burnt offering. Um, and it lays out all the requirements for those daily burnt offerings that were offered twice every day. Uh, he says this, this burnt offering can be from a herd, from the flocks, from the birds, but it had to be a male. And I, uh, one Bible teacher was kind of looking at, you know, why these different ones were cho chosen and everything. And I don't know the answer to that, but I, I can almost see different attributes of, uh, of our Messiah in each of these kind of animals. You know, you, uh, as a big, strong ox, and he's, he's the ruler and, and, and bearing the weight and burden for all of us. But, but other, other times he's that uh, male little lamb, little yearling lamb. And, and, and other times he's like the bird that he, he just uh, flutters in and, you know, it's, it's just uh, that still small voice. So uh, there's, I think there's a lot of beauty in, in each of these shadows. And, uh, and I'm sure each of these uh, present a different picture of who he is. Um, this burnt offering is anyone could bring this burnt offering. This was an offering that, uh, in, in, including, you know, some of the Caesars during Roman period, the, they, they had someone on their behalf bring, bring an offering uh, as a, as the burnt offering. So this was for everybody, the whole earth. A anyone, you didn't have to be part of Israel even. You could even just, uh, 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 anyone could bring this, okay, and accept this. Um, we know this is a holocaust offering. Hollow cost, uh, hollow means the whole, it's an old English kind of, and cost meaning fully burnt up. So this, this offering, nobody eats this offering. The whole thing is burnt up to, uh, completely, okay? And in Hebrew, it's, it's the Hebrew word is olah, which it's, it's the one who goes up. So it's, it's essentially, it's going up in the smoke. It, it, it ascended to him uh, up into the heavens that way, like smoke goes up on a fire. But that's related to our Hebrew word aliyah. To, when, uh, when you make aliyah, you go, go up to the land and then go up to Jerusalem to keep the feast, the three aliyah festivals. So it's, it's the one who goes up. This one, as many of them, had to be uh, perfect. In Hebrew, that's tamim. So it had no defects in it. It was a, a, a perfect example. Uh, this offering, 
the offerer came and he placed uh, their hands on the head of this animal to identify uh, that this perfect unblemished animal was uh, taken as a substitute for that sinful person that brought the offering. So it's the, the substitute sacrifice. And this, this offering was offered twice every day at, in, the, in the morning on the third hour of the day at 9 a.m. and then again at the ninth hour at 3 p.m. At their appointed time, day after day, Yah, Yah wanted them to, uh, twice daily, and, and there's lots of meanings behind that. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that as, as we move along here. But essentially, these were, were it's an appointed time of Yah's every single day, and we want to, as His people, be there uh, when He has an appointed time. You want to be there at your appointment that you have with Him. It's you know, uh, I'm a doctor, and I, and I expect you know when we put a patient on the books at a certain time, I expect them to be there because I'm there for waiting for him. So it's, it works the same way. He, he has an appointed time when he wants to meet with his people uh, every day um, at those times. And it was nice today when Nathan brought in that it does uh, every week, for, at least for the evening prayer time. When we're here on Sabbath, we're, we're here to, to ha have that, that time of prayer with you as a body here, which is re really precious. Um, uh, it's, this one was uh, placed on the east side of the altar, and, I, and I'm going to elaborate on some of the significance of that later, because I, I did a mini-study on what kind of things happened on the east side of things. Uh, and right from Genesis all the way up till, you know, there, there's a lot of interesting uh, type shadows there with the, on the east side of things. And Yah said this was an aroma that was pleasing to him in this example. So, you know, without any uh, stretch at all, everyone can pretty much see that this is Yeshua the Messiah. Um, he, he was the, oh, the perfect, the, all these pointed directly to him, the, but both the substitute sa uh, sacrifice for us. He was Tamim, he was perfect in his, in his ways. He is the one who go goes up, because uh, it says, no one has ascended except he who came down from heaven. So he's the one who, who gets to go up. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's fully consumed. Every bit of him was, was set apart. Um, so now... I'll drop down to the next one. Chapter 2 starts with the grain offerings. The mincha offerings in Hebrew. Uh, this offering had to be a fine flour. So again, that, that refined, taking the fire, uh, the grinding it between the rocks and, and getting it down to a fine state. And, uh, and I don't want to uh, add too much in because I, I want to see what, if you can see this too. This, uh, when, when they brought this and, and baked it, they were to put oil, pour oil on it. Or in, in, the, in the one reference there, it says it was smeared with oil. The, the Hebrew is uh, meshuchim, which is re related to the word Mashiach, uh, the anointed. So this, this uh, loaf is anointed. Uh, it's, it's smeared with oil. Uh, just like yeah, just like him. We put incense on this one. Um, the, the Hebrew word for the frankincense is the word lavana. Lavana uh, has white in its meaning. Uh, just like the, the, that spice itself, frankincense, is white in color, but even the term for the moon up in the sky is Lavana. So it, uh, the moon is, is a bright white thing up in the sky, right? Um, Lavana, you know, the, our modern uh, country, Lebanon, which you know, uh, also comes b biblical times, it, it was named that for the, this, the same uh, root word there because it had really tall, white, uh, snow-capped mountains, so it was very white up there in Lebanon. Um, this offering, no yeast or honey could be offered with this. It was seasoned with salt, and the priest took a handful of it and it threw it on the altar with the burnt offering, and it went up in smoke up with the, with the burnt offering, with the animal. The remaining portion went to Aaron and his sons to eat. And, and in this case, in the first one, chapter 1, it says when an Adam brings an offering. So it's, uh, Adam is uh, like man, it's mankind generically, uh, so anybody could bring that. Um, but in uh, the, the text, uh, you switches words, and it says when a nephesh brings this, uh, this offering. Nefesh uh, is, in English, it's uh, the person or, the, or their soul, their, their being uh, used here is the one bringing the minka offering. The um, Jewish sages say that, you know, this offering represents the soul of man, or it's, uh, uh, you know. So what I see here, and uh, let me know if, if you guys can see this too, I see a beautiful bride here. We're the wheat, we're the, uh, the grain. He gathers his wheat into his barn. You know, this, uh, it's this field that he wants to harvest. 
Um, and she's dressed in white. You know, uh, uh, she, uh, we put uh, the, the white uh, frankincense on her. She's anointed with oil uh, and prepared. And not every part of her gets to go up. Only a handful. He, he pricks out that remnant, like that 144,000, to get to go up on the altar, to go, to go up into the heavens with her. Um, I, the, the, that doesn't seem like a, a stretch, hopefully. Uh, and that was, that was new to me when I, when I laid it out this year, because I just assumed all of it was Yeshua, but I think there's, there's a, a um, he is a, a, of the bread of life, of course. But I think there's also a little bit of a hidden meaning in here about uh, here the bride and the groom coming together. Um, and because we, remember, we're from the earth. We were the, uh, created from the earth. And this is, a, this is an offering from the soil. This is the fruit of the soil, the fruit of the ground that, uh, that we get to. He brings forth bread from the earth, we say in our, uh, our blessings. The next offer, offering was your fellowship offering. And this offering could be a male or a female could bring it. In Hebrew, it's the hashalamim. And, and if your ear catches that, there's the, the word shalom in there. And, and the Hebrew word shalom, you know, it doesn't just mean peace like uh, most people think it does. It's more completeness, wholeness. It's, uh, so, uh, and I, I don't want to steal the thunder ahead of time. So let's see. Uh, this is a sacrifice that the offerer gets to eat part of it. Okay? So you, you, you bring up your animal and you get to eat part of it in Yah's house. Uh, and and uh, so it's fellowship with God and with that priest and it's eaten in the courtyard. Uh, the remainder then, whatever you didn't get finished, could be eaten anywhere for up to two days and one night. So if, if you brought a big animal and it was just way too much to eat in one sitting, you could take that back to your tent and still share it with your friends and family for an extra day. Um, this fellowship offering is the one that was offered by the thousands during all three of the annual festivals. So when you, you brought up offerings, fellowship offerings, you were there to have fellowship with the Most High. You're getting to eat dinner at, at the table uh, there in His house, uh, and so it's just beautiful. So it's a, it's a time of, it's a thanksgiving where you're giving thanks to him and, and that's why you're offering this animal up. Um, and it's also fellowship. You're having fellowship uh, with the king of the universe. This one could be eaten with bread made with yeast. Um, and remember back at Pentecost, we taught about those two loaves of, of wheat bread that are, uh, have yeast in them. Um, and I see that as a beautiful... You know, once you cook that bread, it no longer uh, can leaven anymore because you, you kill the yeast off in the baking process. But it's bearing the scars of all the sins that it had, right? Uh, so when, when he waves us as his wheat, you know, we, we still, uh, he accepts us for, for, uh, as, you know, where, wherever he finds us and cleans us up. And he can still wave us. He makes us holy. But um, there, there it's leavened. And so, uh, you know, again, that, that, that bread still bears the evidence that it had been a sinner of some, some states. You know, we, sometimes, even though we're forgiven, we still have bear, bear the scars from that sometimes. Um, and it's an expression of thankfulness. When, the, when you brought this animal, a part of it went to the priest. The breast and right thigh went to the priesthood. That was their, their regular share that they got to keep. And Yah also said that, that, that this offering was also a pleasing aroma. When, when I was meditating on this, I could see, so if you have a, a groom, Yeshua, who's our burnt offering, and his bride, that, uh, that uh, bread, that grain offering, uh, this meal here is like the wedding supper of the lamb, uh, in essence, where you, where you can see we're all having a fellowship meal together, and, and we're all getting to celebrate with, uh, with him, and, and and he and she, but both the bride and the groom, partake of it. And, uh, and, and I, you know, because it's male and female here. Um, so th this was uh, essentially, yeah, that, just that beautiful fellowship meal during the feast days. The next offering, and I believe it starts the next chapter, is uh, that sin offering. In Hebrew, that's the chatat. Now this one... If you look at a list, anytime there's a list of offerings, Scripture always lists the, the sin offering first. So uh, it's not discussed first here in the book of Leviticus, because I think he wants to hold up the, the, the higher esteem of... And, the, and that one's offered regularly, every single day, twice daily, the burnt offering. This one was when, when you had a sin that you had to deal with. 
But uh, whenever there's a list, the first one offered, you know, and we'll see when, when the tabernacle's complete here in a few chapters and everything, Aaron first offers the sin offering for himself and then for the community. And, and so they offer all that first. So once you, you've taken care of your sin, then you can come in and approach and be with him. So th this is the one that is compulsory. It, it, we, you have to take care of this before you can come into his presence. And this offering was for unintentional sins. Now, I'll get into a little bit um, later. I pull up a scripture of what happens when there's an intentional sin. And Nathan's blog this week was very good. Uh, so anybody uh, wants to look at that, it, it ties in with, uh, with this theme of, you know, the, the high-handed sin, that uh, intentional sins. But um, so this, this is something you brought for forgiveness of your sins. Uh, and also for cleansing from defilement. There were certain things that, that defiled us, you know, like if you had a, a loved one die and you, and you were there and you had to help bury them and touch their dead body, you were defiled. You know, death, uh, no matter what it is, or, you know, the, the whole thing with the seminal emission, that's the death of a, a sperm and, and a women uh, when they, uh, a, an egg dies each month, the, the, they're exposed to something dead for a little bit. So that we have to get rid of that defilement because he's the author of life and death can't be in his presence. So you deal with, and so somebody might say, well, I'm not sinning, but in a sense, you, you've become defiled in some way because you, you, uh, you touch something dead. So this helps you get rid of that and, uh, and get for forgiveness there. Now, interesting, in this chapter, you don't see that it's a pleasing aroma to him. Uh, so I was surprised. I thought, wow, so m maybe our sins, uh, you know, it's, it's just like the dad, and I like the way Nathan, uh, in your uh, Torah study guide, it's like sometimes we have to spank our children, and we, we do it because we love them, and we want to see them do the right thing, because we want to see correction in their lives. We want to see them uh, turn their lives around and, and not go that way, because they, they, they could either be hurt, or, or that we know as uh, we have wisdom as an adult that, boy, if they continue on that path, it's going to be nothing but misery. But uh, we don't take any pleasure in the discipline, but uh, we know it's good for them, you know. So... Uh, I wonder if, you know, because this one wasn't a pleasing aroma. Um, Yah allows for a graded amount of um, penalties uh, of, of sorts for, for these sins. So those who know better and, and, and should know better and are held to higher esteem. Because you see, if a high priest sins, then they had to offer the, a, a young bull. And that was, that was your most prized possession on your farm. Your bull was your, your tractor. You know, yeah, he, he did everything for you. All the hard work, you, you had your bull you know, uh, pulling and plowing the field. And, and, you know, and all the, uh, the stuff you had to, if you had to grind grain and stuff, they could have the bull treading out that, uh, that uh, grain that's on the ground to flatten it out and, t and turn it into fine flour for you. So uh, that was a, a big penalty. So the high priest who should know better, if he sins, he has to sacrifice a young bull. Same thing if a nation sins. If a whole nation sins, the penalty is a young bull. And we kind of brought that up in the Feast of Sukkot because we noticed there, there are 70 bulls offered during that feast. So I see it as we, we know there's the tab table of 70 nations in, in Genesis chapter 10 and that he's offering for all the nations to come up and, uh, and have a way to deal with the sin so they can come up and be with him and keep the feast. Um... Oh, and that, I would just go back up to that burnt offering. You notice anyone could bring it. So to me, I see anyone can accept Yeshua. You, you, uh, once you accept him, then you become part, you grafted into the house of Israel and you become, uh, you're no longer a foreigner. You're uh, grafted into the commonwealth and you're, you're part of his people then. So uh, he allows for everyone to accept that, that and bring that offering. So, um, and then, so he grades down, if it's a leader of a people, he has to bring a male goat. So that would be like a king or a judge. Um, for every day common person, they could bring a female goat or a lamb to take care of their sins. If you're poor, you can go out and get a dove or a pigeon. And I uh, brought this in with my nephew and his wife when we were talking about this because we were watching uh, the book of Matthew there. And, and we see, you know, what did Yeshua's parents bring as the offering uh, uh, after uh, she was cleaned up for, from the birth there? Remember, uh, some Bibles say two tur turtle doves or, you know, so th this was a, a poor person's offering that they brought. So it, it kind of tells you their, their state. Uh, they weren't, he didn't grow up in a, a well-to-do, wealthy ho household. It was, it was a poor family he grew up in. Um, and then he even allows for the very poor, that the, uh, they could bring a tenth of an ephah of fine flour. Um, but you, this one was not, uh, frankincense was not put on this one. So, so this is not the bride, as, as I see it. You know, uh, she, she's not dressed in white. You, you're just bringing 
your uh, bit of grain to deal with your sins because he wanted to allow everyone to deal with their sins to be able to, to come and be with him. So even if you could, and remember the, the poor, we weren't to, to glean the corners of our field. We had to, to leave those unharvested and you weren't to go back over your, your vines a second time. Whatever was left so the poor could find some way to get sustenance and so that they could go out into the edge of a field and gather, gather up that grain so that they could still come and approach and be with him. He perfectly allowed for all that. The last offering mentioned there near the, at the end of this Torah portion is the guilt offering. So in, in Hebrew, that's the asham. And uh, this offering, there were some sins that required uh, some restitution. Like uh, scripture uh, talks about the, you know, the, like if you've got a bull that you know is in the habit of goring people and he gets out and you, you didn't do something about it and he hurt, hurts somebody else's animal or something and kills it, then you, you're responsible to not just pay for that sin, but you have to add something to the value. Because there was something you did, you know, or like, you know, we're supposed to have around our rooftops, if you have a place where you can stand, you know, a little fence up there so somebody doesn't fall off and get hurt. And, you know, you don't leave a pit un, uh, uncovered if you dug a pit so, so somebody doesn't fall in and get hurt. So these are things that um, there was a penalty required because you should have known better, uh, you know, stuff like that. So um, it's the same thing in modern day. Like if you have a dog, you know he's a biting dog or something and, and you're not careful and he gets out and bites somebody. Um, there's, you have to add to the value on this one. So this was the, that penalty for the sins that required restitution. Uh, and 20% was added to the value of these things to deal with that guilt. Because uh, the, the, the others, that for, uh, the other sin offering, like, you know, we don't have any control over some of our bodily functions and things. And, and you know, if your loved one dies, you don't have much control over that. So, uh, so Yah just allows, there's just, just a set uh, thing to take care of that. But these are more things that we probably should have known better. And uh, we let it happen anyway. So uh, to deal with the guilt associated with that, that he, he allows for... Uh, to take care of the guilt. Um, I didn't have any new revelation because I, I, in both of these, the sin and the, and the guilt, I think the only thing that takes care of sin and guilt is the, the sacrifice of our, uh, our king when he came and, and took care of that. So um, I, I think these both still have to point to Yeshua because that's what he does for us. We get his imputed righteousness in our lives. We take on that righteousness because he takes care of those for us. Um, so and unless when we discuss this uh, after if, if somebody else has any uh, different um, understanding that I didn't see I'm, I'm, I'd love, love to hear that so in recap of uh, that first part here we see as, as I see it that burnt offering pointed to, to Yeshua uh, every bit of that and every, every bit of how it's described uh, and it's beautiful how often we're supposed to remember him. Um, you know, even uh, in temple times, not everybody went up to Jerusalem every day. Most people had homes throughout the land. But they would stop what they were doing because they knew at those, at those set times that in the temple at that time an animal was being offered as a burnt offering. And um, if, you, if you read some of those uh, early uh, rabbinical or uh, Jewish sage writings and stuff, they talk about these men of standing. So in, in each town, they had men, because some of the people didn't have a job that they could just stop, but, but you, you would have enough men that would go down to pray together, and, and, and they, they stood for these prayers, because it's, it's showing honor to, to, that there's an animal being sacrificed on their behalf at, that, at those two times, at the one in the morning and the one in the afternoon. And uh, I mean, I see that even, you know, Judah, they, they'll still look for... Uh, uh, what's the word, uh, a group of ten, a uh, minion uh, to, to pray with, because they take that, remember, uh, when Abraham was bargaining with, with Yah about how many people it would take to save a city, and he got all the way down to ten. He said, if you can find ten people in that city, I'll spare that city for the sake of those ten righteous men. So today they try to at least get ten guys together to pray at the, at the prayer times, because those ten guys praying may be saving that city from bad judgment coming on that city. And, and so it made me think, am I doing my job uh, for, for Portland's sake? Because it's, you know, it's getting more evil by the day. And, uh, you know, it's only by his mercy that he's withholding his, his hand of judgment on these cities. I, I know I've got brothers of Judah that, that uh, I'm sure still pray in, in, that, in the city there. 
but it'd be nice to have people who, whose faith is in Yeshua the Messiah uh, be stopping what we're doing. Uh, we get really lax. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I love that saying. I've heard sloppy agape. It's, uh, where it's uh, that sloppy kind of love where we, we, we stop showing the, the respect and the reverence. Uh, that, you know, and there are certain aspects of Christianity that do still have that. But uh, we don't want to lose that reverence and respect for him, too. Um, so... Um, Stopping what we're doing, uh, if you can, and have a little time to prayer. I know uh, we were talking about stirring up the nest earlier, about um, being better at serving him. Um, and I tie this in a little bit later, but you know, a tithe of a day is 144 minutes. Uh, so I, I, admit, I, I admit before you that I don't uh, give him 144 minutes of my day. Uh, I wish I had more time to do that, and I, I don't know what that adds up into hours. Uh, but that's over a 24-hour period. Two, Two and a half hours. Yeah. Now, you know, I, I, so he says strive for the, the prize of the mark of the high calling. You know, you, you want to, uh, when you run a race, you want to be the best in the race. So if you want to be maybe part of his 144,000, his bride, that might be something to strive towards. Yeah, try giving him the 144 minutes each day. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I, I'll admit I'm not there, and, I, and I'd love to be, but uh, yeah. Um, Again, to reiterate uh, and recap, I see that Mincha grain offering uh, pointing to his bride. Um, I see that fellowship meal is that w the wedding feast for, for the groom and the bride and all those invited guests. And see, the, then we have true peace and wholeness when the bride and groom are together and, uh, you know, there we are in his house. Uh, that's when we have that, that uh, shalom, uh, that, that, that beautiful presence. Um, and I put in, too, that the sin and guilt offerings are needed to be able to ever enter into his presence. Um, I quote Ezekiel 46 here, because um, this, a lot of folks feel, has not been fulfilled yet. It's a future, it's Ezekiel's temple in the future, and it talks about that every day they're going to provide those year-old lambs without defect for the burnt offering to Yahweh. Morning by morning you'll provide it, uh, you are also to provide it morning by morning a grain offering. So but both the, that grain and burnt offering every single day, consisting of six, six of an ephah and a hint of oil to moisten the flour, present this grain offering to Yahweh as a lasting ordinance. So uh, there's lots of things in Scripture where he talks about forever. Now, I say, so, so the lamb and the grain offering uh, and the oil will be provided morning by morning for a regular burnt offering. If we look at this in the context of a man and his wife, I see this foreverness as be, that they're, they're married forever. It's, uh, it's, uh, they're they're going to stay together, and they're always going to be together as a, forever and ever. Um, now, I, there's lots of folks that teach about, you know, how could we ever uh, go back to a, a sacrificial system again? Um, Tim Haig does a good job of teaching, and I've, I've heard his teaching on this, and I, and I can agree. You know, the, uh, in the past, it, it pointed forward to Yeshua, right? So why not, in, in the future, why can't it point back to the past of his sacrificial offering that, that he did for us? So it, it's all these things are, are teaching tools for us. And what a beautiful teaching tool to, to see this, this innocent life have, having to die on your behalf because of your sin. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. So... I have no problem with in the millennium if, if the temple is re restored and that there's sacrifice being offered with King Yeshua being there, uh, uh, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, but there being sacrifices every day. Because there will be still flesh and blood people and they'll still have to eat and everything. So um, we'll, the uh, animals will still be giving their life uh, for our uh, sake of our life, uh, as I see it. But, uh, you know, we'll, so we'll see. But I, I have no problem with that. Um, I tie in, uh, just, just so you can see, uh, how that, that Yeshua fulfills that burnt offering. Because scripture records in Matthew 15, 25. See, it was at the third hour when they crucified him. And we're not used to that, that terminology because they started from um, num numbering the hour from uh, daylight, first daylight, okay? Um, they live in a pretty equatorial region. Uh, I forget what latitude uh, Jerusalem is there. But it's not. It's about equal longitude. It's about the same as Southern Texas or something, right? Uh, no, a little further south, Baja, oh. California, just a little bit south of the big California border, just down there. 
And those of you who know anything about our, Earth, our planet here, when you're in an equatorial region, we don't get much daily variance. You know, we live really high, far north here. We're above the 45th par parallel. So we get lots of seasonal variation in our day, day length. You know, in the, in the winter, our days are really pretty short here. And in the summer, they're great big long. But in Jerusalem, there wasn't very much change. So uh, pretty much, uh, in fact, if you're on the equator, most of your days are starting at 6 a.m. and they're ending at 6 p.m. Day after day after day, like days don't vary hardly at all uh, b between the seasons. So the third hour of the day, so from 6 a.m. When, when sunrise is, three hours later is 9 a.m., okay? And then, so that's, that's when he, he was put on the cross. So uh, he, was, he uh, dripped blood and, uh, at, at that point um, and was, was there being suffering for our sins as part of the morning sacrifice or the time of the morning prayers. Um, fulfilling that morning by morning. And then Mark 15, 33, a little bit later, Mark records that it was at the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land. So sixth hour, six, hour, six plus six is 12, so this is high noon. At high noon, when it should have been uh, complete uh, brightness out, darkness came over the whole land. Until the ninth hour at 3 p.m. And, and we'll see that's, that's when Yeshua died he, uh, he, uh, at 3 p.m. At the ninth hour, Yeshua cried out in a loud voice, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is, uh, he's quoting Psalms, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then uh, right after that, it says, with a loud cry, <sighs> Yeshua breathes his last. Another corollary scripture there is uh, Luke 23. Uh, it was, he says, it was at, at the sixth hour, noon, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour at 3 p.m., for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Yeshua called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. So I think Yah wanted us to know that Yeshua was that burnt offering. He was that morning and evening sacrifice. The, t the time of the morning perfectly fulfilled exactly at the time of the morning sacrifice is when he uh, was put on that torture stake, and then he died right at the time of the evening sacrifice. And if you look through Scripture, there's lots of beautiful things that happen precisely at those appointed times in Scripture. And I've, I've kind of mentioned that before. I mean, look at <coughs> Elijah uh, confronting the, the priests of Baal up on um, Mount Carmel there. Um, it was exactly at the time of the evening sacrifice when fire came down from heaven and lit that. You know, and, and we see that it was the time of the morning sacrifice when the Ruach was given there in Pentecost uh, in Acts chapter 2. So... Um, if you want to line yourself up with Yah, you need to be aware of his, his set-apart times. So I said I would uh, uh, just touch a little bit on that, that idea of the intentional sin. Uh, we read in Numbers chapter 15, verses 30 and 31. It says, but anyone who sins defiantly whether they're native-born or alien, and they blaspheme Yahweh, that person must be cut off from his people because he has despised Yahweh's word and broken his commands. That person must surely be cut off. His guilt remains on him. So that's the when you know better and you're going to do it anyway uh, kind of sin. There's, there's no f uh, forgiveness for that. You know, uh, you would uh, thank heavens he's a very merciful God. That, uh, and, so, and he loves us dearly. So, uh, but you sure don't want, and, you know, and he realizes we're children, we're learning. Okay? But uh, you sure don't want to be that person. And, and you notice, right after the, he says this, Scripture gives us an example of that person. The guy that went out and started uh, gathering wood to make a fire on Sabbath, when uh, uh, he knew better. And the, and the congregation had to deal with it pretty severely. They took the guy out and, and stoned him to death. Um, so, being put out of the camp was a serious deal, because uh, try surviving out in that cruel uh, wilderness, that desert, on your own without Yah's protection over you. Uh, it, was, it was a big deal to be uh, cut off from his people. Uh, I'm gonna basically death it basically was a death sentence. Yep. Yep. Uh, I mentioned uh, earlier that about the placement of that, the burnt offering on the east side of the altar. Um, uh, I wanted to just touch on a few scriptures to, because uh, there's some kind of cool stuff going on there about the east side of things. Um, we realize back in Genesis chapter uh, 3 there, verse 24, 
He says, after he drove man out, and this was out of the Garden of Eden, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Um, it makes you wonder if the Tree of Life is pretty close to that east garden, uh, the gate to the uh, garden. Um, and that, that that was the way they had to leave. They left through the east eastern gate to, uh, to there. Um, and so... You, uh, the way back in might be the same location. So uh, when Ezekiel's describing his uh, future temple, his millennial temple, he, he records that the glory of Yahweh entered the temple through the gate that faced east. And we know, uh, my understanding is, the glory is Yeshua incarnate, uh, you know, um, d d d d uh, living here in his, in his glorified state. Because um, he says, Then the man brought me to that gate facing east, and I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. Imagine how beautiful that's going to be, seeing him walking around. Uh, <laughs> you know, it just brings up a quick memory of a, a funny story. I went to, to Penn State for my undergrad degree, and uh, we had a, a football coach there that everybody just adored and loved, uh, Joe Paterno. And uh, it would just, I would get a kick out of me when I'd be going to class and I'd be thinking, that's Joe Paterno in front of me there. Because he had, uh, you know, status of like being a, a great uh, college football coach. You know, imagine what it'll be like walking in the city and, and, and you see the king walking by uh, in, in, in this state. How beautiful that will be, you know, uh, what a thrill that will be. Uh, Zechariah uh, chapter 14 and, you know, we, uh, Meg, we were talking about the prophets and everything. This is one, uh, one of the, the prophets. Um, then it says, Then Yahweh will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. So this is a future fulfillment. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half of it moving south. Now, uh, Nathan brings up in, in, in your... Uh, it was either in your blog, no, I think it was in your, your Torah portion, where you talked about the place where Yeshua was sacrificed was likely, uh, as some scholars believe, it was up there on the Mount of Olives as, uh, where, where he died. Because that's, uh, according to Edersheim and some other folks, that's where the uh, go altar of the red heifer was. Um, and he very much typifies that altar of the red heifer to, clen to cleanse us. Um, so... This, uh, th again, that mountain is east of where the temple is and where the, where the city of Jerusalem is. So it's just east of there. So when he comes back onto earth here, and, and we'll see that, um, Acts uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 12, it says, After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. So he appears to them uh, um, after he died, and, and uh, this is the last place they get to see him on the 40th day. Uh, and there's 10 more days until it's going to be Pentecost here. Um, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid, them fr hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. It says, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. And they said, men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here looking up in the sky? And I, I, I get a kick out of it. Because like, come on, guys, get to work. Quit, quit just uh, looking up at the clouds. <laughs> um, uh, he says, uh, this same Yeshua who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go up into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. So that uh, scriptural reference there tells us a couple things. One, that they were, that the place that where these guys were standing, when, when Yeshua left earth for his last time uh, seen here bodily on earth, was from the Mount of Olives. He stood there with them on the Mount of Olives and he went up into heaven there. The other thing is, these two angels tell us that the, he said the same place where, where you saw him go up is right where he's coming right back down to and he's going to come back here to this Mount of Olives again. And we see in the Zechariah uh, one, uh, in, the, in the prophets there, that when he sets his feet on there, there's all those enemy, uh, armies going to be gathered around to try to uh, do battle against him and oh, he's going to just make a quick end of them, essentially. Um, all right, so that... Uh, finishes that first part of, of the teaching there. Where do you, where do you, uh, the uh, wine libation, that's one of the aspects, and some people link that with the um, 
Olat Tamid, the burnt offering, but where you didn't mention that, where would you figure that into this whole thing? Because yeah. It's listed separate, although, you know, some people list the minka with the burnt offering because it was, you know, really kind of the same thing except for poor people, but then the wine libation was poured out on the burnt offering. Of and all this happened twice daily. You know, from what I, from reading at Edersheim, like, so you, you have the, the grain offering and you have the burnt offering, but you're also at that time burning incense. The priest goes in twice a day to burn incense. So that, and this is where we, we get the idea because incense is uh, clearly in, in Scripture prayers. So it's a time of prayer. So the incense is burnt at that time and the, and the wine is poured out uh, into the... Uh, I guess there was a rim or something around the altar that they could pour the wine in. And from what I understand, according to Edersheim, when they, as soon as the priest poured the wine, the Levitical choir would start singing. That was their signal to begin uh, the songs for that day. And, and the, so they had their l liturgical songs that they, they started probably in the morning, just like our Siddur, you know, with the Mika Mocha Belim Yahweh, you know, and, and, or all those uh, beautiful uh, liturgical songs. Uh, the, and imagine a beautiful choir uh, choir of, of guys just all singing together and, and they had instruments and things that they play so uh, I, I don't I mean do you see that as a separate offering or a part of the burnt offering or because it is listed separately but it was part because if, if you add those you got the burnt you got the minka you got the wine libation you got the sin you got the guilt or trespass guilt and trespass and you got the peace on that's six and six is kind of like the number of men. It all covers all hmm. aspects. I don't know if that links up or not. But no, probably, yeah. I was just wondering where you... I just covered this week's Torah portion, only those ah, okay. uh, offerings that are offered in this week's Torah portion. Okay. Okay. So I didn't touch on the others so much. But uh, in, uh, thinking about that Ola Tamid, I had a teaching for, that I did years ago, and I, I was going to pull that in quickly. It's, it's pretty short uh, to kind of touch on. And it, it mentions... With the, with the wine and, and all those elements and how they talk about uh, different aspects of when we come together with him at those times. But, um, and you know, we know the fruit of the vine is, or the grape is, is his blood, yeah, typ typifies it really that. And it, it, it clearly points to his blood, that wine. Libation. Yeah. But I didn't get any new revelation on anything that, uh, and, and, I'm sure, and I'm sure that's way deeper than what, you know, what I'm seeing so, there. But. So you, on all the ones you cover, which is all the main ones, other than the wine libation, in your mind, uh, it, it all points to an aspect of what Yeshua did when he died on the cross and it covered, covers an aspect of man's sin. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that the only thing that was new was, was to, to look at that as a bride. Because as I started looking up some of the words and I was reading in the Hebrew, it was like, Lavana, that's white. And it's just, so he's dressed in white. And, and not that Yeshua's not dressed in white, he is. Yeah. But I could see, because uh, a handful gets to go up into, uh, with, with him. Um, I saw aspects of the bride in there this year that I'd, I'd never seen before. That's, um, good. that's good insight. I never thought about that. The reason I, I asked about the sin, uh, because that's my understanding, all these offerings were all different aspects of sin that we have committed, or humans commit, that Yeshua covered in his, in his, uh, by his death on the cross. Yeah, I mean, look, when you read down that list there, it, it's, it's, it's right in the face, it's, it's Yeshua. Absolutely. He, he's that male, the perfect male, and uh, the substitute for us. It all points to him, but we, because we take on some of his attributes, that's the only place where we can become part of that grain offering. And even right. the fellowship offering. I mean, that is, if there's any offering that maybe doesn't specifically point to Right, him, right, I could see that too, right. But the fellowship offering is the result, once the price has been paid, and, 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 and fellowship, you know... You can't have fellowship without, exactly. without dealing with your sins. So you come back with a thankful, great... Yeah, heart, okay. And basically, it's a barbecue where you, as the... As the recipient or as the offer of the fellowship, you get to eat some of that sacrifice along with the, the priest, and you're having a meal, and it's relationship restored. That's so right. Again, that's the We're made whole then. What Yeshua did, yeah. and the result of his death on the cross. That's how I see it. Oh, you know what? Else? I didn't bring. I, I'm, 
forget. Okay, I won't forget. The, you know, look at the, the mincha too. That uh, the, we, were, we were to be salt and light. Look at she she's seasoned with salt, and then the, the oil is, is what was the primary source of light in most people's homes in those days. So she she was salt and light too. So. Um, I, I don't know. I was just blessed to, to when I started looking at that. Uh, it was Lavana that kicked me off on that idea that wow, she's she's got white on, you know, and uh, and so it made me th think about the Solomon. She's, I believe, there's a verse there. She, her skin is either white, and that's the word Lavana, uh, or else she's dressed in white. I don't. I haven't looked at that uh, in my in a little bit. Theory. Okay. But uh, that, and that's a picture of the bride. And the same as the moon, which is the name of Lavana, is you know the moon is like the bride. He's the uh, he's the sun, and, and we're the moon. Being the lesser light is a picture of the saints, who is reflecting the sun of righteousness. As she went, who's the greater light? That's Yeshua. That's right. The world. So it... Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name. He is near, he is near, he is near. Yeshu Hashem Behim Atzov Kerabu Yoto Karov Karov Yasuv Rashad Darko Hashem behim 